Well, Canada is, was built on treaties, which are nation-to-nation -nation agreements um, to utilize and share the lands of Canada. There are pre-Confederation treaties and post-Confederation treaties. The most recognizable ones are the post-Confederation treaties, which are the number treaties, 1 through 11, which take up most of Canada, as you can see in the slide. Uh, the purple is the number treaties. The yellow lands um, are guided by pre-Confederation treaties, things like the Royal Proclamation of 1763 um, and the Peace and Friendship Treaties. Um, the number treaties are very, very deep and sort of really lay out the framework for how the land would be utilized. Um, and in some cases, there's arguments under whether the land was surren fully surrendered and ceded to the Canadian government or if it was a an agreement to share. Um, the yellow areas are the areas where this hasn't happened yet. Um, and it most notably is in British Columbia, Yukon, and Nunavut. The Eastern Canada is really dictated by the pre-Confederation treaties. And we are still seeing modern day treaties being negotiated right now um, in those areas that are still yellow. So, keep, so let's look at why the treaties were signed. The treaties were signed because the settlers of this country saw that there were staple economies to be developed in this country, largely in oil, gold, diamonds, and other minerals and resources that they needed to secure. And in order to secure access to those, they needed to make agreements. Again, you have to note that these treaties were nation-to-nation -nation agreements, contracts uh, that were, are bound by both nations, both First Nations and the settlers alike. Um, and they were to have equality. But what we saw once settlement really began in this country was that there was an imbalance of power. The most notable was the fur trade economies where we saw First Nations really suffer. Um, and then that kept repeating itself as we've seen economies move throughout history. Um, the, the colonization of this country brought imperialism, transfer administration from the private capital control to a nation state government really began um, and the government began to dictate how lands would be administered in this country. Um, the one thing to note is that First Nations, again, nation to nation, were never allowed to be a part of the development of how to administer lands in this country, although Canada did maintain its promise to uh, preserve cultural rights to hunting, fishing, and trapping in perpetuity. So we move forward, and what we're seeing in this country is the imposition of colonization tactics. The most notable is the Indian Act of 1876, where we saw all sorts of assimilation policies take place. Um, one of the most sort of racist pieces of uh, amendments to the Indian Act was in 1921 when we saw ceremonies, First Nations ceremonies were banned. Um, what we should note about this is that the Indian Act was never written in consultation with First Nations. Uh, we saw the residential school uh, policies, which we saw the removal of First Nations. Mental, physical, and sexual abuse was an epidemic or an endemic across this country, and we're still seeing the ramifications of that. So, you know, the Indian Act, just to let you guys know, the Indian Act, it was enacted by, in 1876 by the Parliament of Canada under that constitution in 1876. However, what we saw in 1982 is that those rights were then entrenched into the Canadian constitution, which protects our rights. Constitutionally, our rights are now protected and that they cannot be degraded by any other forms of legislation. Um, so it's right in our Canadian Constitution that it states that, and it's really important to understand that. I know there's a lot of contention around what the Indian Act means. First Nations don't necessarily uh, respect it because of the fact that it was developed without clear consultation with First Nations, but it still allows there to be a foundation for what our rights mean and how they are protected. So let's fast forward. Let's go to modern day right now. So I don't know more, uh, and the things that brought us to I don't know more. What it really sort of took set the stage for these challenges and this sort of mobilization of Indigenous peoples were the omnibus bills. First, we saw Bill C-38 come through. We saw um, sort of national opposition from environmental groups largely because they felt that this was a steamrolling of environmental safeguards. Um, most notable of these safeguards that were being steamrolled was the Fisheries Act. And the reason why this is relevant to First Nations people is because 
right in the Canadian Constitution, in the Indian Act, in our treaties, is the right to preserve our hunting, fishing, and trapping rights. Environmental rights and the degradation of environmental laws goes hand in hand with the environmental, or degradation of treaty and Aboriginal rights in this country. Next, we saw, well, what we saw with Bill C-38 is it passed. It went through, the first part of the omnibus goes through, Bill C-45 comes to the table, and by this time, First Nations and people across Canada are getting more and more pissed off. Um, the Harper government, the most notable in, in Bill C-45 that really raised red flags for many people, and most notably the First Nations, was the changes to the Navigable Waters Protection Act, which reduced the number of Canadian lakes and rivers that are protected. So about 99.9% .9 of the rivers are no longer protected. Those rivers and waterways are the lifelines to our communities, um, to our plants, our medicines, the fish, the species that we hunt and live off of. Um, and intrinsic to us being able to continue practicing our cultural and constitutionally protected rights. It wasn't just being noted that this omnibus bill uh, was, was hurting First Nations rights, it was being noted by a, cro a broad sector of the Canadian public. Uh, this is just a cartoon that was in the Globe and Mail, stay sharp, the Tories may try to sneak something past us. Um, and that's, that's true. Uh, even though First Nations were the ones raising the, re the red flags and the alarms on this, we saw a broad section of, of Canadian laws and legislation being changed and degraded through omnibus bills, both omnibus bills. Um, and uh, so it sort of started to bring the sectors together a little bit. Um, this is a, a campaign that ran by Lead Now, which says, this federal budget or, which would you choose? This federal budget or a Fair Canada? And one of the things to note in this Lead Now ad is that it, in the Fair Canada, it says respects First Nations rights and brings Canadians together to make wise decisions about the land, water, and air. Um, and that's because a lot of the things that we saw in the omnibus bill were to further uh, support Canada's opening up of the resources in this country, which were the foundation for making these treaties. So, along came the protests. Bill C-45, protect our people, our land, our rights. Uh, the First Nations communities across Canada began to call out the fact that Canada, Canada can't hide genocide, trick or treat, omnibus Bill C-45. Um, a lot of the Canadian First Nations saw this, these, the changes in omnibus bill as an attack on our First Nations and treaty rights, our constitutional rights to protect and preserve our lands. And that they saw this as another form of genocide or colonization tactics to get rid of the Indian problem, as was used, some of the language used in the early colonization of this country. And a movement was born out of this dissent and dissatisfaction of Canada breaching its agreements, our collective agreements that we made with the government. Um, and it was born online. It was blogged, it was tweeted, it was posted on Facebook and every social networking sphere you can imagine. And it, the phenomenon really took off. Uh, what was really, really interesting about the Idle No More movement is it wasn't just about a, a movement that was just online, it took offline elements that we started seeing teachings popping up across the country, across North America, and across the globe about what treaties meant, what First Nations rights meant, where they really stemmed from, understanding what the treaties were, understanding things like the Indian Act, and understanding that we have constitutionally protected rights to protect those, our, our rights to hunting, fishing, trapping, and cultural rights, and we have a treaty right to consultation for anything that affects or infringes on those rights. Um, and that's where this big opposition really came from. One of the most notable things about the I Don't Know More movement was youth participation. The youth participation in I Don't Know More was absolutely empowering and astonishing. And I think a surprise to a lot of Canada because a lot of people say things like, uh, First Nations traditional uh, lifestyles are old and outdated and we're moving to modern lifestyles. More than 50% of Aboriginal people live in the cities, so why do we still need to protect those things? Well, what we saw was young people coming to the forefront and saying, no, we want those rights protected. Our ancestors, our grandparents, they signed these agreements to protect and give us those rights, and therefore they need to be upheld by both parties. So it was really interesting to see that sort of emerge out of this. 
Um, you know, again, I'm just coming back to, to resources because what we saw with Idle No More was this dissent and dissatisfaction with Canadian legislative policies and a breakdown of democracy that allowed corporations to move uh, more quickly and continue to just business as usual and even business more easily. Uh, and what we saw was a failure to meet the rights of people in this country. Um, and that has led to the cumulative removal of lands and the ability of many First Nations to continue their rights, the poisoning of species and medicines. Um, this is, a, and it came right into our own backyards here in Alberta because we are home to the largest industrial uh, project on the planet, which is the Athabasca um, oil sands. However, one of the messages that has been trying to get through and sometimes suffering because of the way media frames this is this is not just an Indian thing. If you care about people's rights, if you care about the environment, if you care about Canada not uh, being sold to fossil fuel f companies, and if you care about, it says here, the danger of game over for the planet, which is climate change, then you'll care about the changes that we've seen. Um, then you should support I don't know more. And so as these does the discourse around I don't know more is continuing to move forward, what we're seeing emerge is a crossover of different movements coming together. We're seeing that happen in the labor sector, we're seeing that happen in the environmental sector, we're seeing that happen uh, in the children's rights sector. All the different sort of sectors are now starting to realize, hey, we do have a common interest. We want to see democracy. We want to see this, can, this, this country move in the right direction and support human rights. Because, um, you know, after all, we are in a bit of a crisis, particularly here in Alberta. This is a picture of development in 2001 versus 2011. We are already dealing with the pace and scale of development that is destroying the landscapes and the ancestral homelands of many First Nations, including my own. Um, we're seeing massive human rights impacts uh, with, with cancers and the degradation of, of the waterways that are vital to our communities. Um, you know, First Nations communities throughout the Athabasca watershed have reported health concerns, um, yet there's this petropolitics and the lack of concern, um, which people are terming as a slow industrial genocide in the region. The water impacts in the region are egregious, like we're dealing with major diversions of massive amounts of fresh water for the profits of industry and um, at the cost of First Nations and, and species survival. So, um, and we're talking about massive land impacts, this is a crisis. This is why we're seeing people come into the streets. We were seeing people come to the streets in hundreds and thousands from December until recently. Um, and you know, the one thing that I, I try to say is if we're fighting each other, we can't fight the enemy. And it's absolutely imperative that we all continue to come together now. So I just want to leave you with a few things. Um, uh, this is a picture, two pictures. One is a strike, a union strike, a Chicago union strike, and on the other side is the First Nations marching in the capital city, uh, one of the mass mobilizations during the peak of I don't know more marches. There is very little in the difference. What the biggest difference that we've seen is the way that the media has framed this. Both sides are fighting for the rights and the infringements of someone infringing on a collective agreement. Whether that's a union agreement or a treaty agreement, we have the right to stand up and make those uh, responsible accountable. So, where do we go from here? For, for me, particularly, there's a lot of different ways we can go, but really what it is is about creating equality, it's about creating stability, economic stability, green jobs, good jobs, moving forward in a way that's respectful for everyone. Um, and, you know, this is what we're really fighting for. 
for, for me and the Athabasca Chippewan First Nations, a lot of us, uh, we've been in the news quite a bit because of our challenges of industry, and it's not because we're anti-development or anti-industry, it's because of the pace and scale. And I don't think any of you can argue that the pace and scale in the Athabasca oil sands is out of control. We cannot keep up with the industry uh, the way it is, hap uh, the, the damages that's happening to the land, the socio-economical impacts and footprint it's putting on Fort McMurray and even in the labor industry. We have to figure out a way to address all of those things before we can move forward. And most importantly, First Nations people are a nation. And we have a nation-to-nation -nation agreement and we have the right to make Canada accountable to that agreement, and we need to be equals when it comes to creating legislation and moving forward in this country. Thank you. Masicho.